This is the Mended Paths Podcast with Chadwick Hayward, episode number two. Welcome to MendedPaths.com. Let's get back to bed. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining me for the second episode of the Mend It Paths podcast. Today, we're continuing our conversation with my wife, Tara Hayward, and we're going to continue talking about our journey. We're going to touch on some boundaries as well as the addictive aspects of the standard American diet. We'll discuss the bounty as opposed to reductionism of this type of lifestyle. We'll discuss our benefits that we've experienced. We'll touch on the food guide slightly, and then we'll finish by talking about what we eat in a typical week. Last week, we talked about how we got started with watching Fat Sick and Nearly Dead and Juicing, and then later we um, read more about Dr. Joel Furman and kind of got more into the solid whole food uh, plant-based. And so, yeah, ju- juicing was a great way for us to get our taste buds accustomed to the taste of fruits and vegetables, which were definitely lacking in our diet prior to that um from from here we went through a period of of a slow transition where we essentially ate the normal stuff a little bit we were switching to more whole food plant-based um and and that went on for quite some time i would say about about a year of that where we were slowly adding more fruits and vegetables Um, It was kind of cyclical in that we would read a book or watch some cool nutrition videos and that would make us a little bit more hardcore and we would we would be more whole food plant based. But then we like as time passed, if we hadn't learned something new, we would slip more and more into old habits and then we'd watch another video and then we would get... um, get more hardcore again and and basically that that went on for quite some time and over that period of a year we read several books mostly by dr joel Furman, and we watched uh i I don't think it was right away that we found um dr gregor's website nutritionfacts.org um that was kind of a a transition point for us because once we found that it was it wasn't you were sitting down to read a 400 page book it was you could watch a two to five minute video and it was a bite size piece of information on the latest science research and that that really spoke to you and I because we're I I think we're both of a scientific mind and it's like yeah show me the evidence right everyone out there has an opinion on what is and what isn't healthiest and and uh, there's a lot of people who talk the talk and are great at putting on a show and having people buy into it uh, but they don't necessarily show you what supports what they are outside of um, the before and after photos that they pop up on their website or show on their videos. And it's you get skeptical and it gets hard to uh, eventually you get desensitized to it. And you're like, well, it's all just it's well, all, just, all of them have that little star at the bottom results. Not typical. That's right. You know, how believable can it be after? You see that on every single one. And yeah, and it's they they none of them make any effort to say this is the reason why um, you should believe it. Like there's no like, well, look at these scientific researches, research papers that show this or these experiments that have come to these conclusions. Um, and so Dr. Gregor really he went through for those of you not familiar with him, he goes through all the nutrition journals in a year and brings you the highlights of what's the latest in nutritional science and so and then he makes um they call daily videos but i think right now they're coming out every second day or something like that but um they're short videos that really gets to the meat of the matter uh, pardon the pun and so i guess that was kind of how our transition kind of kind of went i think for for me I still had vices. I still drank and and whatnot. And so I think the hardest part was basically getting... I, I found it hard to be a person that was in moderation that could say, oh, well, I'll just have a, I'll just have a beer here and there and, and everything will be fine. But one beer turns to six beer and, uh, what, oh, it's just another, it's just another kind of deal. Um... So for me, I think in order to be truly healthy, I had to dive headfirst. I had to, well, not dive headfirst, but 
uh, take the complete dip, so to speak. I think it's much easier to be a person that um, just says, no, I don't drink alcohol, as opposed to a person that says, I drink a little bit of alcohol. I think it's much easier to be the person that says, no, I don't eat meat, than it is, oh, well, I eat meat on occasion. Um, well, I, I dabble with dairy. I think that's much more challenging. And it's, it's one of those things, it's like people always say, well, don't be afraid to treat yourself, right? I think it's much harder to choose to have a small bag of chips once a month than it is to just say, well, no, I don't eat chips. I've, I've established a rule for myself. The rule is I don't eat this. And then I'm either following that rule or I'm not following that rule. Um, when you put limits on it, it's easy to be like, oh, well, it's just a little bit. It's, it's, only, it's only this little one. It's right. Oh, I'm at a party. It's okay if I have that extra cookie. But I guess it really, for me, it really comes down to, is it healthful or is it not healthful? And if, if it's healthful, then it's something that I can do and I can evaluate from there. And if it's not healthful, then it, why would I want that in my body? You only get one. Uh, life is short. The amount of enjoyment I get out of eating fruits and vegetables now far exceeds the enjoyment I would have gotten out of eating a bag of chips or eating a chocolate bar or having a beer or any of those mind-altering uh, drugs that you can you can partake in. Absolutely, and I think that's a nice thing to talk about too is is boundaries as well as the addictive power of <clears throat> pardon me, the all of the foods particularly, but other substances as well that we are used to consuming in the standard Western diet. And they truly are powerfully addictive substances that eventually you will lose the desire to have. And that's that's the powerful part is, Chad, I'm sure you would say that you don't feel deprived ever. Absolutely In not. making your choices to abstain from these things. And and again, this was a slow transition. This was this is how you see it now, but it didn't happen overnight in that way. And so, um, you do really start to appreciate the delight of taste in natural foods. And you know, I never thought beans or celery could taste so good, just so flavorful, and they really are. And that allows you to start seeing the concentrated flavors of the addictive foods. They really do hit you in the same parts of your brain as an addictive drug would. Well, that was one of the, that was one of the big changers for us is I think it was one of those videos where we watched um, an MRI video of a person's brain on cocaine and a person's brain on sugar. And it was the exact same reactions that you were seeing in the brain. Like these bad foods are addictive foods and they're designed by food manufacturing companies to trigger that addictive response to keep people coming to back give to you them. that high and you're right i cannot eat an apple today and get the same high that i would if i was to eat a couple of m&ms a previous vice of mine if you couldn't tell already um they're ju- they're not the same and that's good your body and your brain are not meant to function on instant high followed by a crash evolutionarily that doesn't make sense yeah and i can definitely tell the difference if i am to have a treat now but coming back to setting boundaries chad you said that your way of complete abstinence is the way that works for you and that's great and again coming back to how much we've learned through our our forays into the books and the videos and things you don't want most of these things when you learn how disgusting, in some cases, they really are. And terrible. Disgustingly terrible. Disgusting and terrible for you. You just don't want it. But the truth is, all of us eating this diet are addicted to those foods. So there is a time where your body is healing from that and recovering from it. And like an alcoholic... You are always addicted to those things. So you will feel that high just because that's what that chemical does if you are to have them. But it starts with the small changes and setting some boundaries. So 
A good way to start is to stop having it come into your home. And if you really want to have a treat outside, then that's something you can gauge for yourself. But if you're going to have a good, set yourself up for success at home, don't have the temptation there. And have lots of good fruits and vegetables chopped up, ready to eat and snack upon in the fridge at your fingertips because these are low calorie foods that are extremely nutrient dense and especially in the beginning your body is going to benefit from having more rather than less and the other key to getting over your addiction is it's not about depravity in fact it's about bounty and having so much to choose from that you don't make it about starving yourself or denying yourself if you want something, you get to have it and more than you ever thought you could. And there is no guilt. You are free from that feeling of guilt and self-loathing in that, oh, I ate an entire package of M&Ms yeah. or a full bag of chips to myself. You know, if you eat, if you eat a whole box of blueberries or strawberries or cherry tomatoes, whatever you happen to like, that's good. You should reward yourself, pat yourself on the back for not leaving any blueberries behind because that's helpful. That's good for your body. You get to celebrate that. You're, you're so you're so right about the it's more bounty. Like I would say that I eat double or triple the quantity of food that I used to eat. So it, it isn't really depraved. But back to your point of addiction as well. That's that's totally true. I, like I said, it's easier for me to be completely abstinent and that may not work for everybody um, but that doesn't mean that I don't um, s drive by a billboard or catch a scent for something that um, I used to eat and my mouth would start watering right that natural trigger response is is oh look five guys burgers and fries I caught the smell of that doesn't that grease smell delicious my mouth auto automatically waters but I know that um, from past uh, misgivings that if I were to break down and eat that, it wouldn't take very long before I felt very unwell. And it's, you you know, like your, your body still triggers that mouth watering, ooh, you should eat this response, but you know uh, cognitively that that's not helpful and you will actually have a bad reaction from it. So those lessons make it easier to make better choices in the future as well um, because you're you're getting the knowledge feedback that this isn't good as well as the knowledge that you're actually learning and knowing that it isn't it isn't good it's very pavlovian isn't it yeah yes they're they're designed to trigger Salivation, totally, truly, in Ring this a bell case, and I'll salivate. That's right, um, and that that probably will take a really long time to go away. It will. But how do you feel sad or deprived when Not you drive all. by it? You know, you say break down and have it, but are you really suffering? saying, I feel like I'm missing out by not having these. Well, the, the breakdown really came from uh, previously in the transition. Now, it's definitely not a, like, at this point, I would never break down and have it. Um, I think that's just an expression, realistically. Well, it's yeah. getting to the point now where I smell those things and I actually recoil from it instead of salivating because yeah. I know how bad for me it really is. And I can test this on any given day. If I have something with a really high salt content, a really high sugar content that I normally wouldn't, um, again, my body is clean and these things hurt you inside, truly. They hurt your cells and they're bathed up against all of your tissues in your body. So your body says, ouch, and you feel it. I call it the salt hangover if I'm to indulge in some chips or something. You, do f you don't feel yourself and you know something is off within you. And I notice when that is finally cleared from my system. Yeah. Then I feel normal again. And I have this really healthy baseline of normal that I can tell when I'm deviating from it. Yeah, and it's a matter of deflection as well. Like 
if I were to salivate from something, well, then I can use that salivation to eat an apple or a banana, which is my favorite. But you strike true with the recoil type of response because I know when we're out walking or whatnot, like um, before the smell of a barbecue would have been like, mmm, I want a barbecue. Now, now I smell a barbecue and my first thought is, oh, didn't we watch that video that said that even the scent of barbecue is a carcinogen and people who live in proximity to uh, deep frying restaurants have higher cancer rates. It's like, oh, I smell that smell. It's time to hold my breath for as long as I can to get past this area where these carcinogens are no longer present. Yeah, you're like, oh, no, don't expose me to the car- cancer-causing <laughs> agents. I get get away. Absolutely. Yeah. So, So it's like the perspective has changed the world has stayed the same but the way i see it is is definitely different and again on our theme of transition that did not happen overnight not at all you know that's mostly happening with us in the past couple of months six months yeah Yeah. Yeah. i would say and we're over two years into our journey so again don't expect an overnight change in yourself and your habits and your outlooks on life but do enjoy the journey along the way. It's so wonderful to see the changes in yourself and how much energy that you have and how positive your outlook on the world can be, even though it is frustrating um, sometimes to see how set up for failure or the the deck is stacked against us by the food industries. But um, The advertising and it's everywhere. Oh, it's inescapable, but the the knowledge really is the power and in reading the books and watching the videos you get to discover that there is a whole community out there of educated knowledgeable support you know you learn about dr Furman and then you discover um dean ornish's work and uh, caldwell esselstein and Col- t colin campbell and john mcdougall there are several medical professionals who are basing their practices about evidence-based practice. What a concept. Around lifestyle medicine. Around lifestyle medicine, that's right. And, you know, you can get to see if you get into watching them, they do have little variations about what their idea of the best plant-based diet is. Um, And it's interesting to watch those debates unfold and decide for yourself. I think we're pretty well not black and white, but show us what the best evidence says. And that's what will help us make our decision. Yeah, I I will. If I will change my habits um, based on the evidence, right? It's if if you tell me that black tea is better than green tea, and they've done this huge study to show it, well, I'll start drinking more black tea, or I'll try to switch to more black tea. Um, but that doesn't mean that I still won't enjoy green tea because I like green tea. So I, I, I will probably still have green tea. But and I'll, there's plenty of evidence to say green tea is great for you as well. And that's actually the fact is green mm-hmm. tea is the best type of t- tea for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, and it's important to know that it's not on or off. It is a sliding scale. You know, eating more fruits and vegetables is better than eating just uh, is not better is better than not eating more fruits and vegetables it's best to eat just fruits and vegetables but if on your transition it's important to just add more add more of the good stuff don't see it as a reductionist type of diet Um, see it as an addition Um, again it's a bounty you should be able to eat significantly more fruits and veggies and so just add things add value add positive to your diet and to your life and and see the see the benefits that come from that i know for me since we've transitioned about two years ago i've lost what would it be about 45 pounds i would say without really trying only recently have i started really working out per se um and if anything my weight has gone back up by a couple of pounds but nothing nothing significantly relevant Um, so like, and and I, I considered myself healthy, a good weight before I didn't really see myself as being all that pudgy or anything like that. And switching to a whole food plant-based diet, I lost 45 pounds. 
um, like going from 180 down to 135, like that is, that is huge. Um, and then like the, the other benefits I've seen, it's I, my depression. I, I've, that's completely gone away. I've struggled with depression my entire life and that's completely gone away for me. Um, I used to have IBS and that's completely resolved. I haven't had an experience with that in a long time now. Um, overall my my life has gotten happier and and better in general and it's like it really brings credence to the old saying you are what you eat and you get in what you uh you get out what you put in and really should you be putting in processed food and junk and and crap into your body no you should be putting in what we've evolved to eat and that's uh whole plant foods and things you would find in the environment yeah absolutely i've um i like how you talked about the ailments that you used to have and how you're so much healthier now not just healthy but happy and also about how you didn't think you were overweight you thought you were a good weight and i mean yeah it's pretty amazing how powerful the message is that we're seeing today in that having a little bit of, of chubbiness on you is okay because... You got a dad bod. That's cool. That Well, sure. And at least you're not massively overweight. Yeah. That's sort of the message that we get is try to keep your BMI under 25, which is overweight. It's the, the Moderation is everything is the statement that's keeping this food industry alive, you know, and that it's okay to be a little bit heavier than you should. It's okay to carry a little bit of extra softness. Um, it's normal to have flus three times a year. It's normal to have a bout of depression every now and again. It's normal to have moderate heart disease and moderate diabetes. That's right. And, and it's just not, it's not normal. And when you lost that weight, you were so surprised. You thought, where did it come from? But imagine the amount of toxicity you were carrying around Absolutely. in that 45 pounds. Well, and outside of the parts that you couldn't see, it's like, well, this was fat that was sitting around my internal organs, right next to my vital organs, holding toxins. Like, that's terrible. Getting that off your body can do nothing but good, mm -hmm. right? Yes, and, and I can definitely back you up on the depression piece being gone, having carried an eating disorder for a number of years in my early, my later teens and early 20s. My body image, well, is still recovering, but um, my body image and my sense of what's good to eat and a healthy relationship with food, with food was something that I never had not, not even close, but now I feel so much healthier and happier and like I'm doing the right thing. Internally, it's an odd sense of comfort that you're doing the right thing, and it's hard, it's a little bit uh, fuzzy to explain, but um, it's just the sense that I don't have to worry about it. I can eat massive amounts of food, which in the eating disorder I had, um, with binging and purging, you wanted to eat massive and massive amounts of food, but then you had this guilt crash down over you and this whole cycle that was absolutely horrendous. And now the message is to eat lots, be healthy. Eat as much as you can possibly fit in your body. And now that... Listen to your body. Yeah, and now that the body chemistry is back to functioning optimally you get the right cues when your body is full your wires aren't crossed anymore with the addictive power of the foods that you're eating overriding your body's natural satiety response that's trying to tell you stop eating this but you just can't listen and it's double-edged because the food is so nutrient poor that your body actually does have to say, feed me more because I didn't get what I needed right. out of that 3,000 calories of junk food you just ate. Yeah, my understanding is that the stomach has uh, two mechanisms to trigger that unfull response and it's volume and nutrient density. And so if you haven't reached the right amount of volume or you haven't reached the right amount of nutrients, it's going to tell you, keep feeding you. 
And so if you're eating the standard American diet, it doesn't matter how much you eat of it, you'll never get enough nutrients. So your body will continuously tell you more and more and more. You're not getting the two keys in the lock. You know, you could eat two large pizzas, so you've got the stretch receptors saying, I'm full, and anybody who's overeaten on junk can definitely relate to that feeling. But you haven't met the second requirement of nutrient density. So your body, your stomach is stretched to the max, but your poor body is still saying, feed me more because I need nutrients to function properly. Yeah, in reality, you're you're fat and starving. Yes. Right? You're yes, starving you're malnourished nutrients. and obese. Yeah. And it's just such a, a really odd puzzling paradox that we have gotten to as a society. But uh, I also liked how you talked about it's not about depravity. It's really not. It's about bounty. And we can get into some interesting conversations with people when they say, oh, are you vegan? Or, you know, I might mention, oh, I no, thank you. I'm not interested in the ice cream. And, you know, it's so normal to have ice cream that in our society today that people will look at you sideways when you decline. Who doesn't want ice cream? Who well, that's it? right. It's pretty addictive. Who who can say no, really? Even if you think, oh, you know, I'm trying to be good this week. No, I really don't want to. I'm trying. I'm trying. To, I'm on a diet. My diet says I'm not allowed to eat this. Or you're on, you know, a Weight Watchers diet that uh, that you really can have ice cream, which just makes me crazy. But yeah, so you get these questions, and you have to be able to open up a reasonable dialogue with people about the the diet that you are choosing and the lifestyle that you are choosing, uh, and that's okay. But I don't like the term vegan or vegetarian because it is about what you're not eating. And this is something that Dr. Greger discusses as well. He doesn't like those kind of limiting terms. It's a whole foods, plant-based diet. Dr. Furman has coined the term nutritarian, meaning you try to get as many nutrients per calorie as you possibly can to maximize your health and longevity. And so I try to stick with something relatable Whole foods, plant-based is a bit of a mouthful. It is, yeah. Uh, it definitely opens the door to a longer conversation. So if I'm in a pinch, I just try to say I eat as healthy as possible. The trouble I find with that is people think that they're eating healthy. And to them, that's pasta with chicken and, and a little bit of tomato sauce on it. And it's like, that that's my healthy meal. No, I, I eat fantastic. And we had garlic bread with it. So we, we eat really healthy. Um, so... It's hard to find that balance of uh, simplicity of language and understanding. Because if you look at a food guide, what they're telling you is healthy is not healthy. Pizza fits on the food guide. Yeah. As a rounded meal. Rounded meal. That's the healthiest you can get. I literally thought that in my teenage years. It's got all food groups. It's got bread. It's got some veggies on there. It's got some meat. It's got some dairy. Boom. This is boss. Rounded meal. Rounded meal. I can eat pizza all the time, and and that's the healthiest I can be. But that's just it's not hard true. to say that about ice cream, though. Yeah. I think most people deep down do know even that pizza is not healthy. They definitely understand with ice cream or like a dessert type of challenge that it's an indulgence and a luxury, and uh, it's it's not healthy. Yeah. So people can relate to that. I I question someone on ordering a pizza lunch at a work event for healthcare workers and I got a sideways eyebrow. Oh, pizza's healthy, they said to me. And I laughed outright. It's not. No. It's not healthy and people are kidding themselves and and that is being supported by the food industry. Those creating our nutritional guidelines are creating this quote unquote normalcy of what our diet should be and it's twisted and it's wrong well the the food guide is just not based on science right There's, it's not it's it's got science thrown in there a little bit but it's definitely mixed with uh corporate lobbying and and other interests that aren't public health um if it was based on public health they would be advocating a pure plant-based diet with supplementation so if it was based on the evidence it would be, they would be advocating a pure plant-based diet with uh, the supplementation of vitamin D and say B12, which is what everyone who is solely on a plant-based diet should should take. 
What was it? The I believe it was the head of the um, American Association of Cardiology said there are two types of cardiologists: vegans and those who haven't read the data. Yeah, exactly. You know, it just once you start scratching the surface and actually looking at the nutritional science, there is no way to deny that the standard American diet is not just harm, like not just neutral, and that it's not helping you, but it's extremely harmful for you. And but you you do have to give credit to people in that um, it's hard to it's hard to understand what actually is healthy for you because there's a lot of misinformation out there as we were talking before with opinions but not only that the food industry is a billion multi-billion dollar industries Um, they can afford to have their own quote-unquote science centers that put out studies that are meant to cause confusion right their their interest isn't to show that meat is good for you because it isn't their interest is to cast doubt on the fact is meat good for you so that people who want to eat meat will be able to put up their hands and say oh no the the studies are mixed so we'll just i'll just keep doing what i'm doing and until there's better evidence and and realistically the balance of evidence if you look at independent evidence it essentially all states that a plant-based diet is is optimal for human health and longevity and longevity which are Absolutely. In my mind, very important. Indeed. Indeed. I want to live a long, happy, healthy life. And that is not just possible, but normal. That is normal. Absolutely. And that wrapping your mind around that, that is going to help you make the commitment to sticking with healthy, um, healthy diet choices. And, you know, the drug industry doesn't help that mixed message, does it? Not at all. You know, because... The food that you eat makes you sick and the drug industry comes along and says, oh, don't worry about it. I'll make you a pill for that. So you can continue to indulge in the foods that are toxic for you. And they are presenting quote unquote science that's supporting that their drugs will help you when really it's just pulling you down the spiral even further. Absolutely. Well, yeah. it's, oh, you've had a heart attack. Okay, well, you have high cholesterol. Well, let's just prescribe a statin drug for that. It'll lower your cholesterol. Um, well, it didn't fix the problem. So the the problem will still persist and your heart disease will continue to get worse. But your cholesterol may be a little bit lower because of the statin drug. Um, but you get all these side effects that come along with it. And at the end of the day, it's not helping you. It's in fact making you worse. It's just, um, it's just hiding the, hiding the underlying condition. It's like having a wound, and instead of actually stitching that wound up and bandaging it properly, what we're going to do is we're going to stick something in there to, uh, we, we'll just put a patch over top of it so you can't see it. We're not going to stitch it up, so it, it's going to continue to fester and whatnot because the wound is too big for your body to deal with on its own. Um, and we're just going to hide that, and then just keep because, taking painkillers. Taking painkillers and it, ignore the problem. And obviously, that's not the ideal solution. No, and that's why we are on the path to help everyone get back to better, which we have lived ourselves and know that it is absolutely possible. But it is a pathway that you walk, and it's well, your body has an innate healing ability you just need to give it what it needs to um to do that to heal yourself and to to maximize your health outcome because your body wants to be healthy right but you can't you can't give your body straw and expect it to build a bridge to healthfulness um no no you need to give it brick and mortar and it's brick and mortar is whole plant foods (laughs) But it's amazing how good at being healthy your body naturally is. It's amazing. It is. You know, and uh, health is the natural state of things. And it's not normal to get sick and decrepit as you age and fall into a cycle of dementia and cancer. It's, It's not normal. Health is normal. That's the normal state of the human body. And we are engineered to live... A good hundred years healthy happy hundred years 
It's possible. It's achievable. Now, granted, I will throw a caution out there that there are some genetic disorders that will cause unhealth to people, genetic mutations. Um, but that's such a small fraction of the population that realistically, even if you have one of these, you're going to still get benefit out of eating a healthy, whole food, plant-based diet. There's no one that would benefit from eating the standard American diet over a whole foods, plant-based diet. Correct. And I think that's a pretty big statement to make, but I feel confident in saying it. I yeah. really do. I really do. So should we talk about what we eat in a day? Sure. Yeah, let's talk about what, what uh, Something tangible. a normal week or day would sure. be like for us. So I guess I'll start because um, I do most of our food preparation. Thanks, so, Chad. <laughs> a typical day for us uh, usually starts with a smoothie. We've got a Vitamix and I essentially pack that to full uh, every morning. What goes in it varies somewhat, uh, but there are some staples. Usually there's a banana. There is two eighths of a cup of flax seeds so what would that two be two tablespoons of flax quarter seeds cup. per person yeah so a quarter cup of flax seeds then i usually put a heaping teaspoon of amla powder to get a bunch of antioxidants in there then i throw in possibly some tea any tea that's really sitting around green tea hibiscus tea black tea i usually put in a ton of greens. I'm talking like stuff it till it's three quarters full after those other things are in there. Um, I'd put in some water, some almond milk, and then top it with some berries. Now I can mix that up by throwing some uh, cucumber in there, a lemon in there, some fruit in there if I want, some pomegranate seeds, some chocolate, cocoa powder. So and then that basically makes uh, two liters of smoothie for us. We each drink about half of that and that's kind of our breakfast can i just jump in of course with a couple things so amla powder is dried indian gooseberries it's one of the most potent antioxidant sources on the planet and it's very cheap and attainable so that's amla a-m-l-a a-m-l-a and the uh, greens that we like we do try to vary uh, the greens because variety is key to health so we have spinach, kale, spring mix, um, romaine lettuce sometimes. So uh, sometimes collard coleslaw. greens, coleslaw. Yeah. Try, try, it, try it out. Play with it. See what you like. And do keep it varied um, throughout the week as well. Yeah. And then so for um, snacking, we usually have fruits. So I'd, I'd send like apples, oranges, pears, uh, that kind of thing for snacking during the day. For lunch... We kind of shift back and forth between summer and winter. In the summer, we typically have a big salad. So that right now, it's a nine-cup Tupperware salad is what we would each take for a day. Um, and then that has also greens, usually a cabbage, uh, like a coleslaw mix, which has green cabbage, purple cabbage, and some carrots in there. Usually some sweet bell peppers, some green onions, possibly some radishes. We usually throw in some seeds, like sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds, maybe some walnuts. And, and it varies week to week. We kind of we kind of switch in what we put in and what whatnot. About and a the, tablespoon of, of plant-based fat in the nuts or seeds. Yeah. Whatever that might be. And then so that's, that's our lunch. And then for suppers, it's usually like if we don't have anything big prepared, we'll make a stir fry, which is just frozen vegetables and kind of whatever we want to throw in there and make a homemade sauce usually in the Vitamix as well that could be just something like um, some vinegar some water some ginger uh, some prunes or something like that mixed up to to have a sauce go over it or anything really we kind of experiment we usually um, uh, we try to achieve efficiencies so we try to achieve efficiencies so a lot of times what I will do is I will put on a slow cooker with about two pounds of beans and let that cook for um, say five hours on high and while that's going I'll cut up some vegetables like maybe a full cabbage a turnip or rutabaker um, a few beets carrots and just roast a giant roaster full of vegetables and then once that's all done uh, mix the beans in and then we've got a giant roaster that'll last two or three days don't forget the onions and garlic there's there's always onions and garlics in our beans uh, that's something that you should have every day 
Dr. Furman has the G bomb is what we what we're looking for on a daily basis is greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. Try to get at least some of those every day with the emphasis on berries and greens, really. And then so that's that's usually our supper. And then we'll have for snacking at night, like usually it's probably if, if we're going to eat something at night, we'll probably have some oatmeal with like raisins and cinnamon and allspice. And the good thing about having the big roaster of vegetables is we can spice it differently every night. So Monday I could have it with like chili powder and have it nice and hot and, and put in some, say, cilantro or cumin and make it Mexican. And then the next night I can add curry powder and make it more of an Indian type of uh, type of a meal. And it can, it can vary. Like I can throw in some white vinegar and some mustard and have it more... Uh, traditional Newfoundland type food, which is where I'm from. So it's we we have some flexibility on how it tastes. Yeah, you um, just spice it on your plate. Yeah, it's easy. And so I think that's that's typically what most of what we eat. I would say we we do very little of eating out. It's usually in the home. Most of what I have prepared for food gets cooked in a giant frying pan. We just mix it all together and, and heat it up real quick or uh, steam some greens and, and throw that in or smoothies are are quite heavy we we have a lot of smoothies which is really good yeah and it, it is coming into the fall time and i i do love the our soups that we make in a big pot so for summer lunches we have salads and in the winter time we tend to take uh, vegetable and bean soup and so that is just so delicious and one of my favorite things to do with you on a sunday is make up our our pot of soup. Yeah, and so we typically make a soup that lasts the whole week, right? A big, that's right. A big pot. And that's it's so easy because then it's done, and you don't have to think about lunches for the rest of the week. We yeah. do the same with salads for in the summer, and for suppers we tend to do like a three day worth of food at a time. So yes. we're really not cooking all that much. So it is another way to make it really accessible and not to put pressure on yourself to feel like you have to cook these big meals every day. Just make make a big batch on Sunday and Wednesday, and then it's easy. Yeah, Sunday Sunday is our lunch day, typically. We'll, we'll put together our 10 salads, or 10, or maybe even 12, and then we'll have a, a Saturday salad, too. But so a lot of times we cook on the weekend. So we just do the five, or ten, five each, I guess, ten salads uh, in a big batch, throw them in the fridge, and then all you got to do is get up in the morning and throw your salad in your lunch bag and a few fruit, and uh, away you go. So it really cuts down on, on the food preparation on a daily basis, and you get you get efficiencies out of aggregating it that way. So We are all really busy, let's face it, and food preparation and accessibility should not be a limitation for you to eat in a healthful way. Can I talk about our soup? Of and course. What goes in there. Yeah. So it's one of my favorites. And uh, so water is our base. Mm-hmm. If you want to use vegetable broth, especially in the beginning, do that. It is higher on the sodium scale, which we try to minimize. But you Try to get lower reduced sodium at least. Yes, yeah. definitely the reduced sodium ones, which are available at any grocery store that you can go to. Um, and it does help your taste buds acquire, uh, especially if you're not doing the juicing period at the beginning. It is a little higher in sodium and it just gives that flavor boost as well. If you're so inclined and so eager, um, make your own vegetable broth and just store it uh, in little ice cubes in the freezer and that'll last a really long time if you want to do that as well. We use water as our base and so we chop up celery and carrots and onions and oh my gosh potatoes and turnips and sweet potatoes or cabbage or whatever vegetables we happen to be appealed by at the grocery store that week we try to ensure we have a cruciferous in there so it's either cauliflower or cabbage or something like that is broccoli kale some green leafies definitely should go in there Uh, or that family like chad said so the cauliflower broccoli um, and then beans, lots of beans. So what would you say? Not quite two pounds. Um, oh, it's been so long since we've made a soup. I think we were putting in like four cups of lentils, I think is what we were doing mm-hmm. for a big batch of soup for the week. And one cup makes about four cups cooked. So We were trying to do it so that we each had half a cup per day. And the soup At was going to last for five days. So 
Yeah, so you whatever can that math do that calculation. <laughs> um, yes, and then we spice it with you know savory and basil or whatever spices we feel like for that week. We often make it spicy. That's our own preference, but it is good for the metabolism as well. With the caps capsaicin oil, I think it's capsaicin oil. Capsaicin oil is uh, it has anti-cancer benefits. So if you, I I try. I'm I'm currently trying to increase our level of tolerance for it and we we have a lot of our meals be a little bit spicy but and definitely was less so at the beginning <laughs> yeah you, you get your taste acquired some another way that we like to boost the nutritional quality of the soup is to pour it over a bed of greens if you're having it at home so just put a bunch of fresh greens in the bottom of your bowl and pour the hot soup over it that will help cook the greens and does in fact boost the nutrition and then also you can put in some whole cashews into the warm broth and let them warm up a bit and it's just this crunchy delicious smooth and creamy addition to your soup it's just scrumptious or pouring uh, nutritional flakes on top of it you can sprinkle nutritional flakes and they they melt as well and get like a cheesy, nutty type of consistency, which is really good. We add nutritional flakes to a lot of our meals. It's a staple in our home for sure. Delicious. And um, again, with the snacking, I don't hesitate to have a handful of berries or some vegetables or some fruits. I tend to stay away from snacking on nuts just because they are a concentrated source of fat and calories. Not that that's a bad thing because they are plant-based, but it's almost like you're not utilizing them to your full potential if you eat them by themselves because they are so key for boosting the absorption of other nutrients, particularly those from dark green leafies. You want to use those in tandem so that you get that much more of a nutrient boost instead of just having them by themselves. Yeah, the nutrients bind to the fat in the in the nuts and you're able to better absorb and hold them for when you need them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, I, I think the key to keep in mind is is the variety and and the variability. Like it's it's so easy to just essentially take whatever fruits and vegetables you have and huck it together and um, use spices to change how that meal really tastes to you. And like, once you get into the habit of preparing foods this way, it gets super easy and it's, it's a pinch. It's all you have to do is, is essentially peel what vegetables need to be peeled and wash the ones that don't and throw it all in a pot <laughs> and away you go. I think we're so much more creative in the kitchen. I can definitely speak for myself that I get excited about making a meal now because I think, oh, you know, all the flavors that I can actually taste now and what'll go good with what other ingredients where before when I was eating the standard American diet, it was, oh, I have to cook again. And you know the dangers of handling raw chicken and raw meat in general. So it's a hassle. You're washing your hands constantly between touching these things and trying to keep the kitchen clean and not cross contaminate your vegetables with your meat. So it's it's a chore and it's a And based on research failing. And failing. <laughs> but you do try, but it's it's difficult, you know. So the prospect of cooking a meal wasn't exciting. It was more of a chore for me where now I get excited. I don't worry about that uh, concern for bacteria in my kitchen. And I get excited about what I'm gonna cook today, what it's gonna taste like, what ingredients I can add and how many good ingredients can I stuff into this dish um, to be as healthful as possible? So it is really exciting. Yeah, it is. All in all, our, the way we eat, the way we prepare food, the way we shop is more enjoyable than it used to be. Before, going shopping was a chore. It's like, oh, God, we got to go grocery shopping. Now I look forward to Sundays. I'm like, yeah, Sundays are shop day. And, and we go and we get, we, we go to a produce store and we literally come home with a box that's probably two and a half feet wide by a foot and a half long and maybe a foot and a half deep. And that's just overflowing with vegetables just from that store. And then there's another couple of stops that we usually make as well. And again, the quantity of what we eat in a week, I think last week we weighed it out and it was like we came home with 20 30 pounds of food <laughs> something like that no well, we both ate a pound of kale yesterday for breakfast and then a pound for supper so 
the again the quantity of food you eat and and that'll develop over time because obviously if if you're eating the standard american diet and you go out and you try to eat a pound of kale it's probably going to be too much quantity for your stomach right away you need to stretch those receptors and get get used to eating bigger platefuls of food like and that much fiber on average right now i eat two giant platefuls for supper whereas before it would have been one plate essentially is what i would have ate i can remember it's so backwards i can remember almost wanting to switch to using our small saucers to dish out our supper portions instead of the big dinner plates because it was all about trying to limit your portion sizes yeah and now my goodness we eat two three big dinner plates full of these vegetables and you talked about shopping so if you are frugal at all this way of eating and cooking just will ring your bell because before when we would go shopping we would dread it because it was expensive yeah. meat is not cheap and as you know especially today where people tend to eat meat if not at every meal at least once a day and that adds up in price fast really quick vegetables are cheap we're eating 30 pounds of food in a week but it costs us a very small fraction of what it used to yeah in our grocery bill so this is definitely for those budget wary people eating healthy is not more expensive than eating junk food and meat and if you're on a budget like when you're at the grocery store look for what's on sale that week there will be things that are in season and and get more of what's on sale and but still try to get some variety whatever your budget really allows and any steps you can take to eating more fruits and vegetables is going to be cheaper and it's uh it's going to be healthier and honestly where else would you want to spend your money if like if it came down to it and i had to eliminate going out at all which we don't really go out anyway but i would definitely choose um eating healthier because it's it's better for your longevity, right? Like you want to be around and healthy for a long time. This is where you need to spend your time and money. To give a specific example, I think the cheapest we could find chicken was about four fifty a pound for frozen um, boneless, skinless chicken breast. Uh, and that was in a four kilogram box. So four to $5 a pound. We sub beans now is where we get um, a lot of our protein and our fiber and they run about 68 cents a pound yeah on average so i mean you can you can do the math very simply there four to five dollars a pound versus 60 cents a pound that is a massive savings huge huge savings so that's money in your pocket that's that's monetizable if you uh, if that drives you uh, and motivates you well i i think we're pretty close to wrapping up here so I'd like to thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. I know we talk about this a lot. I hope my audience here is happy to hear from you as well. And and I'm sure uh, you'll drop in for a, a visit at some episode in the future. Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, It's been a blast. And yes, I would be happy to join you again. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Mend It Paths podcast at www.menditpaths.com. If you've enjoyed the show, please do subscribe. And if you care to, share to. See you all next time. Visit menditpaths.com and get back to bed now.